it's always been our goal to understand not just um, the needs of the industry in terms of development, in terms of programs, but to really address the structural changes that needs to be instituted. We need government's intervention. We need to work together, private sector and government. We have to work together so that we can elevate our industry. And these policies are needed for us to thrive. And um, that's the reason why FDCP has been working with Korea, has been working with Singapore, has been working with Malaysia. We're understanding their best practices and understanding how we can adapt it to our local industry. Our lab is a, an Asian lab. And the way it's a little bit different from, you know, say other labs outside is that we are not just labs that concentrate on films that has to go to these big A-list festivals. We also want projects that can actually work within the Asian region. And so they're not like always the art house kind of films, but they're also kind Kind of like you know whether it be comedy or horror that can work in a wider context of asia is something that we are also very active about and not thinking that you're making a film for the international markets make the film for what you believe in and actually that those surprises are films right. that were not made to win uh, oscars do your films and then uh, we'll go where it should go of sharing i think um, you know can help you um, grow uh, get more confidence and, uh, and besides uh, make connections for for me this kind of uh, collaborative um, process is, is very interesting and, and and i think that's something as you said uh, the two of you uh, earlier we, uh, which has a kind of a very interesting impact indeed also because i think indirectly it does help uh, the regional, uh, local regional uh, film industry to, to be stronger also. As a society, we realize with this pandemic that nobody is, we cannot live in isolation. And the film industries and the TV industries cannot also be in isolation. We really need to sort of like find alliances with all the different industries that are affected and how we all come together to sort of like push our agendas forward. And the key agenda is how to have life resume again the way we had pre-pandemic. Girl, I was born ready. Di man to bata nga nagawan. Happy man ka ka. Happy ka. Ako na kalibutan. Ano kaya nang yari sa mga tao no? San kaya sila nagpunta? Galit na galit at malaking malaking dragon na may tiwata na pinangko. Ayun, 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 ayun
Pwede mo ba akong samahan? Pinahinta naman kasi. Hindi mm -hmm. naman. Aabot din tayong lahat kahit iba-iba tayo magkuha. Sabi lang ayoko! Nakausap mo na naman ba yung mga laruan mo? You should really catch up. details on IFIC, please check our official social media accounts. Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash IFICPHofficial. Twitter, at IFICPHofficial. And Instagram, IFICPHofficial. To register for IFIC public sessions and master classes, visit our website at fdcp.ph slash IFIC. Check out the full lineup of public sessions and masterclasses for this year's Film Industry Conference. Visit our website at fdcp.ph slash IFIC. International Film Industry Conference Online 2021 is presented by Film Development Council of the Philippines in partnership with Full Circle Lab Philippines, ASEAN Rock Film Partnership, supported by International Film Commission Partners, Film Philippines Office, Korean Film Council, National Film Development Corporation Malaysia, Singapore Film Commission, and the National Federation of Motion Pictures and Contents Associations, Thailand. International Partners, Can Next of Marche du Film Festival de Cannes, Hubert Balls of International Film Festival Rotterdam, Netflix, Purin Pictures, CFIC Lab, Southeast Asia Pacific Audiovisual Archives Association, Torino Film Lab, Local Partners, ABS CBN Film Restoration Sagip Pelicula, KTX, Philippine Film Archive, TBA Play and TBA Studios, Upstream PH, Viva Communications Inc., Livestream Partner, Digital IC3 Productions. Thank you for joining us today. Sit back and relax as we are about to begin. The International Film Industry Conference, or IFIC, first conducted by the Film Development Council of the Philippines, or FDCP, in 2017, aims to bring together international and local experts to share and discuss the latest trends, opportunities, platforms, and cooperation globally that producers and filmmakers can explore for the development, production, and distribution of their projects with the intent of crossing beyond local borders. The IFIC strives to continue the synergy of the members of the industry by featuring experts and professionals this September 2021. This event will give a platform to further explore opportunities, challenges, and new norms in the film industry as we push and thrive to move forward in a global pandemic. 
Securing funding for your film project, especially with international partners, can be tough work for producers. But there are widely available practical selections that are being offered. This session will delve on several ways on how an ASEAN project can take advantage of the resources available to secure their film funding through grants, tax incentives, gap financing, pre-sales, and the new approaches in the reality of the new normal in the industry. Our speaker for this session is a film producer based in Singapore and Toronto. In 2010, he co-founded e w Films, a Singapore-based film development and production company. He is also the producer of Pop Eye in 2017 by Kirsten Tan, which received awards at Sundance, Rotterdam, and Zurich. Taste in 2021 by Le Bao that received the Special Jury Award in the Encounter section of the recent Berlinale and co-producer of Vengeance is Mine, All Others Pay Cash in 2021 and the winner of the Golden Leopard in Locarno. His upcoming projects include CNC Development Award recipient Mong Girl by Chiang Wei Liang, which was developed at the Cannes Residence, Talents Tokyo, and Torino Film Lab Script Lab. To learn more about essentials on film financing, here is Mr. Wei J. Lai. Hello. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking both um, the FDCP and Full Circle Lab for putting together this really lovely program and, um, and for inviting me to speak. Um, maybe we could put the opening slide, if that's possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so today I'm supposed to speak, um, talk specifically about film financing, um, you know, where to find funding, what are the different sources, how to get them, how to structure your financing plan um, in relation to um, Southeast Asian works. I wanted to start by saying that, um, unfortunately, I'm not a genius business guru. Um, I, I'm still learning all the time and um, I'm particularly looking forward later to the Q&A segment of the session, which I think will be the most fruitful when there's, um, you know, specific sort of questions. Um, and um, yeah, after this session, it's not a guarantee that I've provided some sort of magic words and suddenly everyone's films will be successfully financed. Um, unfortunately, um, it, does, it doesn't work that way. It's um, as, as everyone will know, you know, film financing is a, a difficult sort of thing. Um, I have some very practical, I have some practical thoughts about film financing within the Southeast Asian context, um, based on the works that I've produced in the past and from observing, you know, fellow, um, fellow producers and friends, and um, hopefully by sharing some of these experiences and observations, um, this can serve as a, as a useful starting point or a springboard for your own fundraising efforts. Um, I've also been very fortunate to have been asked to sit on a number of committees over the years to select projects to give funding to. So, um, you know, I think that these experiences have been quite enlightening for me to be on the, to be in, in a way on the other side. And, um, hopefully I, um, I can share some of the thoughts I have, um, and the experience of that and how it's kind of, um, shaped the way that I think about film financing. I don't think today I'm going to be sharing anything particularly earth shattering. I think a lot of um, what I'm going to speak about, I think is it's a little bit more like um, common sense sort of reminders, and maybe it will help in terms of as uh, uh, maybe a small sort of adjustment or a little realignment of, of just, just a way of looking at film financing um, and film producing in this region um, so that hopefully it won't be such a daunting. Um, it won't be so daunting. Um, one thing I'd like to say also is that, um, as with cinema, there's you know there's so many different types of films. I'm very l reluctant to say that you know there's one conventional pathway or one way to, for a Southeast Asian film to find funding. Um, each project, I think, um, will have to find its own way, and um, the onus is, I guess, very much on 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 you to decide what is what is the the best 
for your film. Um, later on in the talk, um, I will talk about two films that I've kind of been working on and, um, and how I guess they're slightly different based on the type of project that it is. Um, so I, I think today, um, what I'd like to focus the talk on is, um, is the word uncertainty in the title of this talk. And, you know, hopefully we can move ourselves away from that. Um, yeah. Um, could we change to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, um, yeah, so this will be the basic structure of my session today. Um, you could say that it's a, a, um, a, in a way it's a loose, you could say it's a loose chronological order, um, towards fundraising. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So I think um, before, I think it's really important that before you even think about, um, before you think about anything else, because, you know, the film world is, is massive and it, it can be quite, like I said, daunting, intimidating. I think before um, thinking about anything else, it's absolutely important that, um, you know, before thinking about prestigious, prestigious labs, um, project markets, local and regional project markets, labs, and things like that before even thinking about talking to streamers, studios, media moguls, film commissions, et cetera. Um, I think it's really important to, to step back and to be, especially when you're first starting out um, your project and your project is at early stage, it's a really step back and to be patient um, and to go back to the very core of um, why, why you want to make this film, um, you know, and to really think about um, the, the project itself that, that you're working on. Um, as you'll know, in film, there's, there's many, many things that are, that will be and are beyond your control. Um, you know, the wider, like, I mean, for example, the, the pandemic that's affected cinema, you know, greatly, which we can talk about also during the Q and A, I suppose. Um, it's important not to be overwhelmed by all of this. Um, partially because it's, it's, um, it's not only it's not in your control. So um, you can only control your own material and your own project. So sometimes it's um, it you might over fixate or over fantasize when you think about what you want the project to be, where you want it to go, and things like that. But um, one way to I think a really good starting point when you want to think about film financing is really just to 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 stay grounded, to stay grounded and 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 within the project and really focus on on what you would like to do um, with with the project um, and 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 what what you would like to say in the project, you can you know you can only do your best when when you so when you control you think about your project and you you really shape the project and try not to be too affected by the ex, um, external factors beyond your control. You know you can only put do your best with your project and you can only put your best foot forward and present yourself and your work in the best possible light. Um, other things beyond your control, you know, you might put the best application or you might do the best pitch that you've ever done. Um, but sometimes, you know, you you might not receive all the grants that you would like, or you might not get investment from the financer that you would like, but um, you can only, like I said, it's, it's, some things are beyond your control, but what you can do is to, um, Put, put your best foot forward and, and, and that. I think um, when, I, when I talk about that um, in relation to your project, I think it's also, it's important to think about it in terms of, um, to, to be very honest with yourself and to be very clear about your project and, and what it is, um, to be very clear about this, because you know, whether your, the film that you're trying to raise funding for is a, a first feature film, for example, a debut director, or it's a veteran filmmaker's 20th film, or it's an art, art house film, or it's a genre film, et cetera. Um, the, the first thing to think about in, in film financing is um, the very first person that you have to convince that this is a worthy project to invest time and money and things into um, before anybody else is yourself. Um, if you have any, for example, if you have any doubts any doubts that you have about your project, whatever area it is, maybe it's about the, the, the script, 
for example, or or you have doubts about whether you can raise the financing. Let's say you think that this film will need to be made for um, a significantly high higher budget because of um, what, what's required. Um, address it. So if you have doubts early on um, with your project, address it. Address these potential issues or doubts that you have until you're satisfied until you're satisfied or at least you come to some sort of satisfactory sort of resolution or solution within you know internally within your project itself because um if you have doubts about it um it's very likely that um in the wider sort of world um there those those will come out too um so yeah like um you can see the points that i've i've mentioned in the slides um i think the first step um, besides this understanding your project very, very well and, and, and not being thinking too much about external sort of factors um, to, to, to stay grounded and not be overwhelmed. I think the first step, another first step um, in fundraising is, is not to rush. I think a lot of times, of course, there's a lot of enthusiasm um, when you, you make a film and there's a lot of, of course, there's a lot of belief in, in what you're doing. Um, but I think that sometimes, um, there's a, there's a tendency because you're you want to get it made as soon as possible you know you feel that sort of energy um it's important to to again like i said to t take a little step back um and always question and um yeah not to rush only apply for um you know funding or only approach speak to the the people that you would like to speak to only do it when when you're ready don't don't try to rush don't try to fool yourself um as 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 you'll know, um, making a film, any any film, whether whether a good film or a bad film, or a a large studio film or a small intimate sort of micro budget film, you know, every film is is already such a difficult and and very painful sort of process and difficult thing to do. So, um, you know, why why compromise and and jeopardize things by, for example, submitting a project that has a really really great potential but it's is not ready to be seen. Um, because like, for example, you see, you see the, the holes in the project or you see the gaps in the project that need, need fixing. Well, why would you want to, 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 to rush to, to, to share the project when you feel it's, when you yourself feel it's not ready yet? Um, um, which of course, you know, you have to control yourself because of the enthusiasm, like, like I mentioned, um, you, yeah, you don't get extra marks or you don't increase your chances of getting funding by just getting an application in by the deadline. Um, it's, it's a funny sort of thing because um, having worked in, you know, the festival setting as well as a film pro programmer, what's always interesting is that um, when a call for entries goes out or for funding bodies as well, when a call for entry goes out, the number of applications at the start is, you know, not very high and a vast majority of the submissions come um, on the deadline day. Um, so I guess everyone is rushing for the deadline, um, but yeah, you don't you don't get um, better chances by just submitting, or and it's not going to increase your chances of getting funding by rushing um, your application. Um, you know, film is a, a long process, which which um, you will I'll I'll show later, hopefully, with um, the two projects that um, I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, I think that since Film is a long sort of process. Take your time to to do your to do your applications um, when you're sure about your projects. You know, take the time to do do your applications or or present your material. Um, do it properly. Um, if if for example um, a deadline is coming up for let's say um, the FD, the FDCP's initiatives funding initiatives, if the deadline is coming for that, if a deadline is coming up for for example the IMDA. Um, grants um, which um, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more later um, if your project isn't ready this round you know don't beat yourself up over, over it um, you know wait till the next round or 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 wait till the right moment um, to apply rather than to to waste an application so to speak because uh, many times um, you only have like one opportunity with with a project you have only one opportunity to to apply for a grant and once um, your your submission is let's say um, is not accepted. You don't have the opportunity to apply with the same project. Not all grants are that way. Some are, are more open, and and if they see a pro 
progression since the last time you applied, um, they will consider the project. But um, yeah, if don't feel that um, you, you need to rush into into applying for for tons of things. Um, yeah, take your take your time and, and do it properly and put in um, a, a solid application. Um, next slide, please. Here are just some um, questions that um, to, to think about, I think, uh, or um, sort of a wider sort of context or a, a wider sort of perspective to, to consider when you are when you're thinking about fund fundraising. Um, stuff that you so, stuff to, to think about um, reality checks, I guess. So I mean, the, the, the first one, for example, um, that um, the reality is that um, for independent cinema, which um, a lot of Southeast Asian cinema is, not, not all, but a lot of Southeast Asian cinema is, um, we're, we're all tapping or we're all targeting or all looking at the same sort of sources of financing. Um, everybody is, is, is looking for those sources. So, I mean, that, that's just the reality. Um, this, I th and I think this is why um, going back to what I mentioned, this is why it's so important that you know um, exactly what project you want to make and you need to know your project inside out, um, whether it's in terms of the story or the funding or, or um, the makeup of the cast and crew and things like that. Um, you need to, you need to know, know as much as possible everything about your project. You need to know the project better than anyone else possibly could. Um, because because of partially because of this because everyone is applying it's it's for a small pot of financing of that's available for a Southeast Asian project for example what differentiates your film from others which might be just as worthy um, on, only you know this yeah um, when I say this of course um, I, I did say that you need to you should focus on things within your control. Um, but yeah, you should also, you should also be aware to a certain extent of um, your competition, you know, whatever you're applying for. And when I say this, I don't mean it in a, an, an aggressive or a cynical or a gossipy sort of way. Um, but, but just just to know that there's there will be other projects that will be applying for the same funds that you are, um, maybe have a, a loose sense of um, where, where you stand in that and use that to not not don't use that to demoralize you of course but use that as as a means to to spur you on um you know and and because because everyone is aiming for the same same limited sources of funding you know there's of course sometimes you can think oh it's a strategic uh, strategically i should apply during this time because i think this filmmaker or that filmmaker um to be really honest there's never a good time to apply for funding any time that you apply for funding is is the right or the wrong time. So um, that's why um, I said earlier not to never to rush your applications because no matter when you apply, there will be you know plenty of strong strong projects, um, and you just have to put the strongest the strongest possible version of your project out for consideration. Um, number two is I guess one of the really big troubles, um, not, not troubles, really big struggles that um, a lot of us will have, which is um, the, you know, the type of film that you would like to make versus the budget versus realistically what you can raise um, for your film. So the second question is really a question about, um, about balance. Um, and, and it's about looking at what you have and, and, and thinking honestly, is the film that you want to make practical? Um, we we all have, you know, we all want to have the the maximal resources um, possible to make the films that we want to make. But um, the realities of the of the market, the the realities of um, the environment of of ourselves, our our own limitations, you know. Um, yeah, you have to balance all of these things. So, for example, um, if you are making a, if you're making a first film, for example, th the reality is that it's highly likely that you won't be able to raise as much financing as, say, a second film 
if you had a, su- first, a successful first feature or a third film, if you've had, you know, two successful films um, prior, whether, whether, you know, successful art house films or successful mainstream films, even that having, like I say, two successful art house films um, will, will affect this sort of balance in terms of what your budget can be and what you can realistically raise. Um, and um, it's always this kind of challenge and it's always a, a, a really, it's, it's a conversation that I think that, you know, directors and producers should have with each other all the time, you know, productive conversations, not fighting, not fighting. And, you know, the director saying, I want more money. And then the producer saying, no, you know, cut down your, cut, cut down the, the crazy scenes or something like that. It should always be a mutual sort of respectful sort of conversation and, and, and being very, um, Uh, be, uh, being um, realistic about uh, about what you can do, you know. Maybe you have like a larger film that you would like to make eventually, but um, you know, take your time to to work towards it. Um, one thing I like to to say also is that you know, film is is a long journey. So um, your your life or your your world is not defined by one film. Sometimes, um, when you're raising funding for one film. Um, it can be very demoralizing, for example, but always think about that that film is a long journey and there's other films to be to be made. Um, you can have a, a long career and there's different things you can do. So, um, you know, a lot, even like the biggest filmmakers, sometimes they make a smaller film first, for example, because they have trouble raising um, financing for their dream film. And then after that first film, they have the opportunity to to make the second one for a higher budget, the one that they originally wanted to make. Mm. Okay. Um, the the third question. So, um, is is your film or is your project a natural fit with the funds and partners that you're looking for? Um, is it is it necessary? So sometimes um, it can be very tempting because of the money available in different or in certain co-production countries, um, there you know there's fin- financing available. But um, before getting all excited and going, oh, you know, I want to apply for this, I want to apply for that, I want to get mon- um, financing from here or for there. Um, it's important to think about, yeah, is it a natural fit? Is the connection, you know, very natural for this sort of collaboration? Um, I'm sure you know you'll have heard in other talks talking about international co-production, if the connection is unnatural or it's a sort of forced fit because you want to raise the financing, for example, um, one, I think you might you might find yourself in a very uncomfortable position later um, trying to figure out how to fulfill funding obligations and, and things like that, um, which in, in the end will put many limitations and compromises on your project. So. Um, something that you think would be liberating. Oh yes, I have more money to make the film might end up being um, a hindrance or a, comp- uh, or a problem for your project because you must, you have to fulfill certain things. Um, this is kind of linked to, to the last point about balance and how much you can realistically raise um, in terms of your budget and things like that. Um, um, the fourth point is also related as well. So yeah, what are the sources of funding available to you? What are their obligations and expectations? Um, does the, the funding that you're looking at um, make sense for your production? Or are you trying to, to shoehorn something um, into your project because, because you need the money? Which is, of course, yeah, the reality is that um, films, whether it's a micro budget or not, you, need, you do need some money. Of course, we all need money to make films um, in varying amounts, you know, to get our films made. Um, and you could say, no, I have to apply for this and that. But um, beyond what I mentioned that you'll find, you yourself might find yourself in an uncomfortable situation later on if you are, let's say you apply for um, certain grants from co-production countries and, and yeah, and let's say you get it, you know, which is great. Um, but the, the more likely sort of scenario is that if you personally already kind of know that the, the connection in, in a co-production or a fund is, is not very natural, the thing is that being on the other side, on the funding body side, um, there, the chances are that they will see what you see. 
if it's an unnatural fit. And they'll give the fund to a project where the funding makes more sense. So um, it, it, it's great to do, let's say, a five country co-production with um, mul many regions. But um, when you do that, sometimes it becomes um, you, when you have to fulfill the obligations, you have to get, um, you know, key creatives from other territories, which is great. Um, but when there's too many or something, it might become really messy. Um, and it, it, it might not really make sense. Um, and, it, it, and it will increase the budget, for example, because you want to fulfill these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of looking at your project in terms of the wider perspective, you know, yeah. So, I mean, when you think about these four sort of considerations, of course, there's many more considerations, but these are the ones that um, I thought were important to think about. Um, yeah, how, how, you know, how, how, how do you get funding? I really think that it's, it's much, it's very much down to being very honest and self-critical um, to think very hard about both the very best version of your project and what you envision that to be and to move towards that. And also at the same time, thinking of the worst possible version of your project and, and how you can continue to work on it. Um, and when I say the worst possible version of your project and how to work on it, um, I'm not saying to, to pepper over the, the cracks and hope nobody notices, but you know, in the worst case scenario that, that you're not able to address all the, the sort of um, potential issues that in, in the worst version of possible version of your project, at, at least, to be able to show in your in your dossier or in your pitching that it's something that you are aware of that, that these are um, potential issues with your project and these are things that you are you would like to continue to work on and develop. Yeah. Um, so the next, um, I'm now going to share a list of possible sources of money for Southeast Asia. Um, and um, you know we can talk a little bit more about it if you'd like during the Q and A. Um, I like to think that it's not so much the point of the session because a lot of these you can. This is to, to me. This is a lot of this is just curated information that you'll and you'll probably have seen similar lists before, maybe even more extensive in other lectures or you know websites and, and things like that. Um, but I thought I'd I'd show it to you. Um, to you, just to get a sense of what's available for Southeast Asian films. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into <clears throat> the rules and regulations and eligibility of all the all of these sources, because I think that would take up a very, very, very long time. Um, I think we can use the, the time we have together um, in a better way to, to talk about maybe bigger sort of picture sort of things. And, 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 and then you can go in. You can go into the application websites later on, for example, and and see. Um, take your own time reading and, and researching afterwards. Um, if we could change to the next slide, hopefully it works. Okay. Oh, great. Cool. Um, yeah. So um, this is a um, like I I placed on the slide. This is a non-exhaustive list of, of funding available to to Southeast Asian or ASEAN films. Um, I've divided it into kind of three sort of loosely three sorts of areas. Um, grants. So there are grants available for Southeast Asian films. Generally, um, I'm talking more generally, but um, yeah, generally grants are is are fundings that don't need to be returned. But you know, it's not like yay free money. No, unfortunately, not. Um, these these this funding comes with you know certain f um, conditions to be fulfilled um, because the the funding bodies they have certain objectives in mind um, when they when they choose to finance different films or put money into different films. So um, it's you don't have to return it, but there's conditions to be fulfilled. Um, I wanted to say off the bat, because I was rushing the slides, that um, Doha is not a country. It should be Qatar. That's um, my apologies for that. Um, so that's grants. Um, there's equity. So um, this is money that um, you'll have to return from whatever the film earns. And it's stuff, um, you know, money that is expected to be recouped, hopefully, in some form. Um, when, when you're putting this is a this is just a very uh, practical sort of thing. So the first thing um, I have there 
director producer deferrals. So um, if you're putting together your application early on, you, you, you know, this is when you've taken your time to put together your project dossier, you're, you think that your project is in a, in a good place, you're not rushing, you can put in a strong application. If at that point in time, you know, there, there's no financing in your film, um, I would put like, for example, director and producer deferrals in. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's to value the work that you're putting in. Um, and I think sometimes you feel people can feel embarrassed by it, but the, the thing is that it is real and it is a realistic rendition of the status of the project. It's that your project is not at zero because, um, you know, the writer director or the writer director and the producer are putting in their time. And these would be the fees that they would, they would charge. These are, are, are real sorts of things. Um, that you're, you know, a time and effort that you're putting. I mean, hopefully um, it will, as you start to raise funding for your film, um, you won't need to defer your fees till the end. But as when you're first developing it, um, I think it's important to put a value to to the work and, and to yourself when you, when you put it in, because, you know, on the application side, when you when you read an application, for example, um, when you see a zero there, psychologically, um, it's not as attractive as if you see at least a figure um, there. It, it shows that you're you're respecting yourself, I think. Um, so, in terms of other other um, resources for funding, there's of course there's if you are in project markets or labs, there are times that there will be prizes available, cash prizes available, or or, or things like that. And then there's, of course, there's sponsorship from, you know, products and things like that. And this can be in cash and or in kind. Um, I don't want to go through each of the of the grants that I've listed there, but just to highlight maybe some stuff about each each um, a little bit about some of them, because they they revolve. They the funding might come at different stages for the different ones. For example, um, the the Doha Doha Film Institute um, funding for that's eligible that um, ASEAN projects are eligible for that is only for post production so that is when your film is in the editing stage so um, it's funding that you can only apply for once you have shot the film and you've edited the film into a place that you think it's is the right moment to to apply for the funding um, there's other post production grants available as well um, for example um, Purin Pictures has a uh, as a post-production grant too. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, World Cinema Fund has one too. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. Um, the, the, the more common, the very common sort of sources of funding for Southeast Asian films are from, you know, sources such as the, the CNC, um, the World Cinema Fund, Hubert Balls Fund. So Hubert Balls Fund, there's many different it has many different categories. They have funding for development. They have funding for production. Um, and in terms of production, there's different categories as well. So um, it's it's tricky to go into all the details within you know a, a 50 minute talk or a one hour talk. So I won't go into that. But um, they have different stages, which is very nice. Um, with with funding like um, CNC, um, with from my understanding, FDCP um, and IMDA. Um, there are funding obligations such as um, the, the the most common one is that you have to spend a certain percentage of the funding that you receive if you receive the grant um, within the, the the country that you receive it from. So, for example, in for the two grants that are available to ASEAN films in um, at FDCP, there's an uh, there's a fund for international projects, which I think which I believe is slightly more, and then there's one for specifically dedicated for ASEAN projects, which is slightly less. Um, in terms of which to apply for, of course, it's it depends on on you and what you think is more suitable for your project. But I, I believe that the funding obligations is around fifty percent, um, five zero percent. Um, cert certain funding bodies, the the ratio is higher or lower. So, um, for stuff such as the Polish Film Institute, I believe it's you have to spend eighty percent, eight zero percent of what you receive in within Poland. So that that's what I, I was mentioning just now when I when I was talking about that it can make sense for your production or it cannot, but it, it depends on on whether it's it's a natural fit. For example, that you naturally want to work or you all had always planned to work with a Polish cinematographer, or for example, or Polish 
editor or a colorist or something, then then it naturally makes sense. If you're doing it, then you go, oh no, I need to find someone now, and then dig, 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 dig. Then it, it might be unnatural. Um, what other ones do I want to highlight? So the Baumi Award is a screenwriting um, development um, fund. Um, Vision Sud Est. Um, I don't think there's funding obligations necessarily, but I believe that the inst the the organization will take the Swiss rights of the film. So that's something to think about as well um, when, when, you, when you raise financing. Um, just to move quickly to equity, um, just to, to break down a little bit of it. Um, um, maybe, maybe you know this already, but um, so sales agents can give a minimum guarantee. So what is, it's, it's basically before your film goes into production, a sales agent that might be interested in your film, an international sales agent that you know sell, represents your film and will sell it to to the world. Um, they they might give you a minimum guarantee, dependent on how much they think they can they can um, make from the film. Um, the figure will be based on, on that, and the idea is that they they will give you that first, and then you you make the film, and then. When they sell the film, they will take back. It's all, I, I guess you could think of it as a form of a loan. They give you that that money upfront. Uh, well, not exactly upfront in percentages, but and then you get it. They when they sell the film, they take the what they give you back first, and then after they have recouped this minimum guarantee, then they give you back some funding. Um, distributor pre sales is is similar to that, where they they come on board and they give a certain amount of money upfront based on. The potential that they think they can make in in the country, um, and you can use that to to make the film. Um, with both the sales agent minimum guarantees and the distributor pre sales, there's there's good and bad to it because um, it will affect the revenue that you receive later. If, um, for example, your sales agent has to recoup their minimum guarantee, your distributor has to recoup their pre sales minimum. Um, you know what they pay upfront. Um, what you might end up you know, you might get the money to make the film, but what you make back later is is less. For example, um, yep, you can for equity. You can also work with a studio. Um, you know, there's different studios and different companies within the different territories within Southeast Asia. For example, that that are open to looking at certain types of films. So it depends if it makes sense for them. Um, you could work with a studio, uh, which which could mean. For example, that you maybe you lose certain creative control or you lose lose certain copyright, um, and it's something that you have to, to to grapple with to see if it it makes sense. Uh, working with a streamer, I think slowly this will become more and more common in film. I think it takes time, but um, you know the big streamers and and you know more regional streamers too um, are 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 putting financing into films, but. Um, a certain type, and it it slowly it'll it'll become clearer, or um, there will be more opportunities. I think, and of course, yeah, there's always finding an investor. Hopefully, not not family, but yeah, um, yeah, there's you can also find an investor. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay. So um, yeah, so now moving on to you have a rough sense that of you know some of the grants available and um, you can maybe you took it down and you can you could take a look at what are the requirements for each of those grants and um, see if it makes sense for for your project. Um, now um, talking about for example applications or pitching or presenting your your project to to. To people, whether it's the grants that I shared, or or equity potential equity investors, or when you apply for labs and stuff like that, um, this is this is just some things to think about in terms of applications. Um, you know, applications take a lot of time to do, um, and they can be the bane of our lives. So as you're in the pains of of putting together applications. Um, and thinking about all the, the money that's going to fall on you, hopefully, um, it's important to understand the the larger function of of you know why why we have to take up so much time. Why why do these different funding bodies, for example, or why do the studios why do they ask for so much information? You know, oh, it's so it's so exhausting. Um, it's important to understand yeah the larger function of this um, in an obvious way, and maybe maybe 
this will help to change the way that you you write your your applications. Um, for example, so some questions I, I like to think about for when I when I apply for things is yeah, or I approach someone is yeah, who is the person or who is reading your application? You know, what do they want to see? And um, when I say that you don't cater your film and you rejig your film to something unrecognizable because you think that's what they want to see, I don't mean it in that way, but it's just um, the first sort of question or the first two questions I think is about the purpose is to think about applications is the purpose is of an application is to for for the reader or the selection committee or something to to get to know you to get to know who you are as a filmmaker to to understand you in relation to your project you know this this relationship is really important why is this filmmaker making this project um, is it does it make sense um, and and the idea with an application when they look at a, an application because you know yeah they don't know you um, is the idea is they want to read the material to form an impression of you to form a an impression of the project and um, and the bottom line really when it comes down to it is they want to read all of these things they want to see your budget lines and blah 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 and and because you know it so well you you'll do it beautifully um, can I trust these people as a selection committee when you're reading is like can I trust these people that they, they know what they're doing if I give them a large sum of money. That's that's the bottom line. And um, you know, you you might know personally as you do the application sometimes, yeah, you might feel like, oh, you know, why are they asking me all these questions? And you might have a certain sort of antagonistic attitude because it, it is difficult. But um, the thing that you must know is that um, you personally might and your team might know everything and all the wonderful things about your project. But if you don't put all of this into an application, um, you know, how will the reader or how will the sec selection committee know? Um, you know, unfortunately there's no sort of osmosis or some magical sort of thing where you can you can share it telepathically or something. So um, yeah, you have to put it in into the form of a, a an application where you, you, you talk about all the merits of the project and you show that you know um, what you're doing, yeah. Um, I think that, um, yeah, that clarity and conciseness in your application is key. Um, when I when I say that, it's whether it's in the writing or in its visual form. Um, the idea there is that um, even if if it's a yes or a no, or you know, it's a no and a rejection to your project when you apply, at least let the rejection be on on the right terms. And not because people simply don't understand the project. So, in the past, when I've been reading things for selection committees, um, sometimes um, you know, because there's there's so much that that the filmmakers want to say, um, it becomes a little bit convoluted and confusing, um, or they feel that they want to you know they see the the page limit or something, and the page limit is five pages for a director statement, and and, and they want to make sure that they feel you don't have to do the maximum. Of course, don't do like uh, the bare minimum, but um, you don't have to feel the need to do the, the maximum and fill fill pages for the sake of filling pages. Um, clarity and conciseness is, is key because um, selection committees are reading, for example, many applications. Um, if you're short and sharp and simple and absolutely clear in what you're saying, um, you know, what you're saying must be understandable. Yeah. Um, it's just it's better reading for for a person and and they can at least they understand what what the film is um you know what you're saying is understandable so give the give um the readers or give the person you're presenting their project to give them the opportunity to to understand what you're trying to say and then and then like it or hate it not read the thing and say i, I have no idea what i just read um or this this i'm so confused when i when i read this this application um, let them read the application and go, okay, I get I get this project and yeah, maybe, oh, no, I get this project. I totally understand it. The filmmaker knows what they're doing, but this project is not for me. Let it be on those terms rather than I, I look at this and I don't get it. Um, so yeah, don't use, for example, don't use overly elaborate words, speak in subtext and be subtle. Let's say I want, actually, what do you want? Bottom line is, let's say I want, I want funding because blah, 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 blah. Um, don't hide it in sort of subtext keep your keep what just state what you want um of course in cinema cinema is all about subtext but 
when you're applying for things, you need to speak as, you know, as clearly as possible about what you want. I'm looking for, you know, uh, a, for example, I'm working for a French partner because I would like to do post-production at this particular facility. I would like to work with this specific person, you know, just, just state it out. Don't, don't hide in, in subtext, keep your text simple. Um, something that I've, I've thought was really interesting that, um, that I only became aware of, um, even though it was, it was right in front of my face is that, um, although many of the applications that we put in for funding, um, like in the, in the slide that I showed previously, although a lot of applications are in English, um, one thing to keep in mind, which is why I talk about clarity, conciseness, using simple words, um, is that a lot of, although a lot of applications are in English, you have to know that English is not necessarily the first language of the assessors that are reading your application. Um, so one thing to think about with applications to rejig your mind is to, to, yeah, to try to understand the audience's perspective rather than your own. Um, yeah. What would you want to hear if you were on the other side? Um, what would you want to see? Um, so related to this, yeah. You know, what makes your project so special compared to others that, that um, it has to be made, you know, because there's many, many strong films and many, many strong projects out there. So think about why, um, think about what's so special about your project. Um, because um, based on based on experience, my, my limited experience, of course, of, of reading applications, um, outside, generally outside of the idea or the script itself, um, majority of the applications and what people write is pretty much the same in their proposals. I would I, I, I jokingly say it's almost like a, um, a carbon copy. For example, it would be, you know, this project is very personal to me. When the film is finished, we are aiming to, to get it into an A-list film festival. We want to work with, um, you know, ABC um, sales agents and we're aiming for, you know, XYZ sort of funds. Um, many, many, many applications, they will say the same A-list festivals. I don't need to name them. Um, they will name the same um, sales agents. They will name the same funds because as I said, there's a limited pot of funding available for projects. Um, so so the idea is that how, how can you differentiate yourself um, from that? Um, because sometimes, you know, you don't have to premiere at a, just because you premiere your film, for example, at an A-list festival, doesn't mean it's good for the film. Sometimes um, strategically, it makes more sense to apply for others, but um, I'm not saying like rejig your, your write up and say no, and go, oh, I don't, I don't, I want to shun all of these things, but um, it's just something to think about that, that a lot of times um, what will make your write up stand out is if you're a little bit different, because a lot of times people will write basically the same thing. So what, how can your project be a little bit different from that? Um, it has to be that naturally, of course, but yeah. Um, okay. One thing I was, one thing that one tip that I received early on in, in my career and I thought was very, very helpful, um, is something that I think I mentioned that, yeah, in the slides that, um, never compare yourself to other films, um, when, when you're doing your proposals and, and things like that in your applications. Um, whether it's in your pitch or your proposal and things like that. There's actually really two simple reasons for this. Um, one is that um, the people reading or listening, they might hate your references and then maybe they loved your film idea and then when they see the references, they hate your references and they hate your film, then, you, then you're doomed, right? Um, and the second reason is that um, people might have even better references in their head of your film or they might form a very strong impression of, of your film based on their own references and by stating out, oh, my film is like this, like that, you've, you've ruined the illusion. Um, yeah. So, so be very, think of your film as something unique. Of course, everyone is influenced by different films, by, by books, by stuff like, but the tricky thing is when you, when you include those specific things in your, in your proposal. Um, one thing that w one potential pitfall is that, that, yeah, that people might hate it or people might have better ones than, than you have. Um, this is another sort of subtle sort of thing that I always thought was really helpful, which is when you are um, writing or when you're speaking to always speak in positives. Um, but when I, when I say always speak in positives, don't, don't lie. 
of course. Um, yeah. So talk about what your film is, not what it's not. So for example, to give a really simple example, um, I'm just going to say two things and you know, what would you prefer to hear? Um, when let's say I'm pitching or something, when I pitch and I say, I don't have a French co-producer yet. Let's say I say that versus I am actively looking for a French co-producer. Psychologically, when I when I hear I am actively looking for a for a French co-producer, it shows initiative. It shows that you're you you're there's a consideration. I don't have, you know, because you're starting with you have the don't. There's there's a certain psychologically there's a certain negativity in it. So. Um, yeah, if it's this, you're saying the same thing, but you're saying it in uh, in a more active um, way. Um, this it's a little bit more difficult, but yeah, one thing to think about also is to try to avoid to to say but, um, you know, use but in 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 your writing when you're writing applications. Um, and the last sort of thing um, I'm mentioning here is yeah, that um, yeah, people might um, anticipate any doubts that people might have about your project so that you to show that you've thought about it and can inspire confidence. OK, next slide. I realize that I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. So um, I'm happy to share my personal sort of strategy towards fundraising, which I don't think is super innovative or a big secret. And it's not identical to every single project, like I said at the start. It really depends. So I'm going to speak a little bit about two projects and show you a kind of timeline. Um, and then we can go from there. So the two projects I'm going to talk about are Taste and Mongrel. Um, OK, next slide. So for Taste, that came out in 2020. It came out earlier this year. Um, this is kind of the timeline. So. Um, like I mentioned just now, the the project. Um, what I like to do with films is um, this kind of few stages. So I mean, filming and release is kind of straightforward. You, you, I don't need to talk about that. So I'll talk about the first three sort of things. So, um, like I said, development. So when you first start on a project, it, it takes a period of time to shape it into something that you are ready to share with a wider world. So in the case of Taste, um, it concretely started in 2014, and then you know it was worked on until about 2016. When it was ready to, um, when everyone in the team felt it was ready to share it with the wider world, um, so yeah, like you see, there are two years of time. It, it takes time to to get it into a certain shape, and then after that, we made the decision to expose it in a limited number of of um, public arenas. So the SGFF Southeast Asian Film Lab, Cannes Atelier, and Torino Film Lab. Um, generally, for for myself, I like to keep the exposure of a project, this this period of exposing the project to, to make the wider world aware of it. I like to um, restrict it to a maximum of, let's say, two to three things, um, you know, maybe one development lab or something to get to get genuine feedback when when your project is at a sort of a, a good stage, but you feel that it can it can be improved. Um, but there might be certain blind spots that the team after working on it for two years, for example, might not be noticing. Um, and then I like to go to one, yeah, one lab setting and then one market setting where hopefully you can find suitable partners for the film. Um, usually the lab that I try to look at hopefully has a certain market setting or opportunity as well, for example. So Torino Film Lab, for example, has, has, a, has a, a meeting setting as well. So you have the opportunity to meet with industry. Um, you know, if you work... Um, if you are in a lab or a market that is during a film festival, even better because you can meet people that are attending the festival and things like that. So I like to go to a few things first and meet with people and then go into the fundraising. So you can see it there. So for me, it, the idea is that you don't want to over oppose, you want you don't want to overexpose a project. Um, that's why in the case of Taste by Le Bao, we didn't want to, once we went for a few things and we were sure, then then we moved on and we focused on the further developing the project and fundraising, which took another three years. So, you know, exposure is great, but one thing to think about is what is the intention of the exposure with project markets and et cetera. The idea is that, I mean, to be honest, you'll be meeting the same people again and again and again at the project market. So it can start to get a little bit awkward. 
um, yeah, there's no need to meet, you know, tons of people and go to a festival. It's nice, but yeah, there's no point in going to tons of festivals and markets and meeting tons and tons of people. What's important is you need to meet the right people. Um, and like I said, right at the start, to be sure about your project, don't be so worried if, you know, you've sculpted the project very specifically and very few people are interested in meeting you. That doesn't matter. You don't need a crowd. Um, what you need is dedicated people that are willing to go on a journey with you. And if you put together something clearly and you understand your project clearly, it'll weed out the people that aren't interested in the project anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can see, I don't need to go into it in too much detail, but you can just see that um, in the case of Taste, it took, uh, you know, it took a while to put together. Um, our partners like the Zimling Films that came on board in 2017, we met them at Khan Atelier and then um, they came on board shortly after Torino Film Lab. Um, Petite Film was, they came on uh, a year after because um, through, 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 through the Zimling Film and yeah, you can see all the other sort of things. So when Wild Bunch International, our sales agent came on board was um, after Petite Film came on board because they were the one. So sometimes if you find the right collaborators and it makes sense for the projects, you get the, the right introductions, which is, is, which is really nice. Um, yeah, sorry, next slide. Um, so this is the project that I'm working on now. Um, as you can see, the, the process where we're in the midst of this, the third stage, which is, you know, the second sort of development and fundraising stage. Again, we went for, you know, we decided to go for three programs and then now we're focusing very much on, on fundraising. So we went to Talents Tokyo, the Cannes Residence and um, the Script Lab. Um, similar sort of thing. So development labs and market sort of settings and um, these are some of the, the grants that we've received so far after receiving feedback at, at, at the labs. Um, there are some other ones as well, but um, like I said, exposure and exposing your project at the right time. Um, we're about 60, 70% finance. So we have some other things that I've not put here, but like I said, um, at the right, it, there's a right time to, to share information. You know, what is the intention of sharing their information? Yeah. At the right time, um, you share the right information, for example, like, um, for taste, Wild Bunch, Wild Bunch International came on board in 2018, but we only announced that they were on board in 2020 because there's there was no point in announcing it earlier. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I realized that I it was a little bit in balance, but it's okay. I think we can go to the Q and A. I think that's a lot more interesting, and and then we can talk about specific things that I that I mentioned in the slides. Thank you for that, Ray J. Of course, at this point, we are opening our virtual floor for our audience's questions. So um, before we move on to the film financing questions, um, there is uh, a filmmaker here, Salim Hadi. Um, they're asking, being the writer and director of my first feature film, what would you advise that I do in order to get a producer on board when I don't have any funds secured yet? Hmm. No, that's that's a good question. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it, it's it's a similar sort of approach as applying for things. So um, before, you know, maybe you have certain producers in mind that you would like to work with already. And um, the idea is that you want to present it to these producers in, in, in the best possible light. So it's it's a similar process in the sense that you you put together something that you think is strong and then and then you, you, you approach the, the producers that that you would like. Um, you might get some rejection. So one thing I didn't mention in, in here, of course, is because I thought it would be I mean, I thought it'd be funny, but then I, I didn't want the tone of the presentation. You, you will you will get tons of rejections. It, it's just because the world is just that competitive. Um, so, you know, have a few producers in mind that you would like to work with um, and and yeah, put together a dossier. Um, or put together some material and then present it to them. And, you know, if it, it if you click, great. Um, one thing I would advise with a producer, don't necessarily look for the most experienced producer, which might be the temptation. Um, look for the producer or work with the producer that feels the most for the project because, you know, working on a project takes an extended period of time. So if a, if, let's say, the more experienced producer is very busy or they're not, they're not super invested in the project. Not, not, and I don't mean that for bad reasons. Um, it might not serve your project well. So um, work with the person that feels the most for your for your project. 
Um, but yeah, just it's a similar sort of process that you put together something that you believe in, and then and then you you just speak to people. Yeah. All right. I hope we answered your questions, Salim. Next, I'm uh, moving on to our very many film financing questions. Um, first off, with the large uh, number of competition right now for film funding, how do I make sure mm -hmm. that my film project stands out? In the international scene, is there a trend on what types of films usually get the funding? Um, it's it's a tricky sort of thing. You're you're right that it's that um, um, that it is it is super competitive. Um, but I think one potential danger um, or something that filmmakers can think about too much sometimes is, is to try to, to locate a pattern in, in um, what films get the funding and, and stuff like that. But um, it's, it's a dangerous sort of thing to do. Like, oh, I think that let's say this grant, this funding body is giving a lot to horror films and then, okay, I'm going to write a horror film. Um, I think what's really important is, like I said, to, to look at what you can control personally. So um, this is the, this is the project that I want to make. Um, and then, and then, and then you apply rather than try to follow trends because following trends is, is really difficult because maybe by the time that, you you're you're ready with your project that trend has passed already so um and sometimes yeah to make it stand out just be your you know shape your project as specifically as possible to to what what you would you would like to do rather than to let's say like for example um the french film Taten just won the palm door don't don't go ah that wonderful okay i'm gonna go or you know a lot of people are doing um pandemic films okay i'm gonna do a pandemic film make the film that or Develop the film as you want to make it um, in the best possible light, and and then submit it for the, for the grants. That's that's all I would say. It's 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 dangerous to 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 try to um, follow trends because trends change very quickly, and um, you know I don't think there's set there there really are set sort of patterns in, in funding bodies because funding bodies are always changing as well. What what they would like to look for and and they're always and they're probably very much aware of what um of this this sort of thing that people are trying to understand trends and they're always trying to shape themselves and and move on further yeah all right well and, and there is um a follow-up question regarding that um in these challenging times mm -hmm. are projects that would be put online platforms getting more attention I, I mean, yes and no. I think that um, yes, because because um, during the pandemic, um, suddenly a lot of you know everyone was watching stuff um, on the on the streamers. You're right, but it's a it's a certain type type of film. If um, you, you're right, but then the with the streamers, for example, they're they are looking for very specific types of films. They're very looking for very specific types of filmmakers. If if you're within that sort of bracket, then then it's it's good, um, but because everyone is stuck in the it's it's a funny thing so that you mentioned the pandemic because during the pandemic because everyone is stuck at home there there has been a lot more applications for a lot of things because people have the time suddenly have the time to to develop things, um, but yeah I think that with streamers it's pushing films in a, a certain sort of direction. Um, I, I can't say whether that's good or bad, more whether that's the type of film that you would like to do. Um, and if it is, then, you know, there's, you have that av possible avenue. All right. Another question here from Olivia Griselda. Um, we're moving on now to questions that is related to finding funds and partners mm -hmm. in the natural fit. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, what's mm -hmm. your process of researching for this? Could, could you share any examples on this from past films that you've worked on? Yeah, sure. Um, could you pull up the taste slide again? I'm sorry. Or, or maybe I don't show the slide. Ah, yeah. Oh, um, one more up. Sorry. So yeah, for in terms of taste, um, our our partners there, um, our French co-producers. We have two French co-producers, Dozum Ling Films and Petite Film. So both of them, I met um, with another project. So um, I met them in 2014, both of them separately, um, 
because they were um, Petit Film, Jean, the head of the principal at Petit Film. He was my mentor at um, Torino Film Lab for a project for Popeye. Um, and Dism Ling Films, I had met them also for Popeye at that time. So I met them first in 2014, 2015. And um, we didn't end up working on Popeye because the financing worked out a different way. But I had loosely kept in touch um, during that time. And we had continued to talk and you know share share our taste and share our love for, for cinema. Um, a lot of times, uh, more and more, I find that the collaborative collaborators that I work with are people that, I mean, it's difficult because of the pandemic times, but um, we, when we could still meet people in person, um, a lot of the way that I would work with and end up working with different people is through, because you, you meet them in, in a, and you meet them in, let's say, a social so setting and you get to know them as people. Um, you know, it's one thing to look at, um, yes, of course, of course, I research them too. Um, but it's one thing to look at their portfolio and go, oh, you know, their portfolio is amazing. I want to work with this person. But then, you know, maybe they're just a really, they're really difficult people um, and it, it doesn't serve your interest. Or, or there might be a frequency difference. You don't, you don't um, connect. Um, then then there, there's no point. So, um, of course, when I talk about this, this is all pre-pandemic time. So it's a little bit, I understand that during, it's difficult to get a, a real sense of a person both on both sides. Um, during the pandemic times. But I would say that even on in a Zoom setting, which is not the most sociable, I suppose, um, just to get a sense of the person um, beyond beyond the company, just to get a sense and to know know the person that's, for me, that's really important because as, as you'll see with taste, um, you're gonna be working with the people for a, for a long time. So if you don't get along in a casual setting, I think that's sort of, uh, yeah, it'll be a concern when when things get difficult and with film things get difficult. Um, so friends, well, I wouldn't say friends, but yeah, in in my case, friends first, then then collaborators. All right. So since you mentioned that uh, your co-producers for Taste were um, friends and uh, um, mm -hmm. fellow um, producers in the industry, what if uh, mm -hmm. the producer? doesn't have that connections yet. Um, how can they verify the credibility and trustworthiness of fund partners or investors, um, knowing how much equity and to who to give up this equity to? Um, by, I think that's the great thing about um, the ASEAN region because um, you know it's a it's a concentrated um, collection of there's a it's a small group of people but. Um, that are very generous. So you can just ask. Um, I think a lot of times it, it's it's just a, a message or or getting on a quick call. You know, oh, this person has expressed interest in my project. You know, do you do you know about them? For example, um, it's it, um, you can just ask other people. Of course, and, and the the obvious way is you can you know you can Google and you can check on them their credits, you can look on IMDB, um, you can see what other projects they've been on in the past. But I think the most obvious way is just to, to ask around, to ask um, if, if you know, maybe the, the person that you're thinking of working with um, has worked with someone you know, and then you can just ask them what they think and they go, oh no, you know, maybe I don't think I would recommend it or something like that. A lot of, you know, film is a communal sort of thing. So, and I think it's really important, especially for, for a region like ours, that we should be that yeah, we to to share to share the information and to share um, our thoughts on people. So uh, you know, for example, maybe there are French co-producers or German co-producers or something that that um, I've not worked with, but I'm familiar with, and maybe they're not suitable for the particular projects that I'm working on, but they might be suitable for you. Um, so it's just about yeah, it's just about asking the the community, um, and. Yeah, I, th I think it's just it's that. Um, but, but of course, I understand when you're when starting out, it's difficult. But I think by attending if events such as this, by attend um, hopefully eventually in person or attending you know film festivals, and 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 meeting people, then sometimes you'll you'll have these kinds of crossings, um, and and that will help you. And that's why I think film development takes time because you have to form relationships and you have to to understand um, people too more than all the technicalities. I think it's more about understanding people. All right, thanks for that. Now we are down to our last two questions. Um, many of our producers here want to ask 
Um, when coming when coming into a partnership with a co-producer or a funder, um, what are the specific terms or conditions that we should look out for or uh, give an utmost review when we are entering into these kinds of um, partnerships or fundings? Mm. Um, I guess to, I mean, definitely look at the contracts because the contracts are all different. But yeah, look at the obligations um, when you're applying for funding or when you're working with a co-producer. Um, because everyone is busy, just be upfront. Ask, you know, what 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 do they want from the film? Um, let's say with a co-producer, for example, what what would you what do you want for the film? Do you want the uh, let's say if you're working with a Singapore co-producer, do you want the Singapore rights? Do you want some percentage of the IP? Um, you know things like that. Um, do you want um, a certain amount of creative control? So it's about it's about understanding the expectations from all parties with with grants and um, stuff it's a little bit more straightforward because there there isn't really that negotiating power so like for example if you apply for imba or you apply for cnc or world cinema fund it's it's stated quite clearly in in their in their funding sort of regulations so it's either you agree with it and you sign or you or you or you you don't agree with the terms and you you don't get get the fund, but generally, yeah, things to look out are for our, what are your obligations, whether it's spending obligations, um, whether it's about ownership, for example, with CNC, I know that um, the French co-producer has to own a certain stake in terms of the IP. Um, and you, you, you have to, you have to understand that. Yeah. So I guess that those are the important things. Yeah. All right, I hope our producers noted that. Now down to our last question. This is from Anne Magadia. She asks, how do you think the pandemic impact film financing? And because travel is limited now, can you recommend how we can look for good collaborators or co-producers now? Um, uh, yes, there's, I mean, the pandemic, like I said, I think it's been good because it's, yeah, yeah, no, it's terrible, but... Um, to try to think of it in a more positive way. It's given more time for development, um, but that also means that a lot more people are applying for the grants because they've had time to to develop things. Um, so, I, I mean, hopefully the backlog is sort of, the backlog of projects is slowly going, going down, um, but it's, yeah, just like the pandemic, I think a lot of this kind of stuff is, is out of your control. Um, but, and, and, you know, maybe some funding sources are giving less guess less funding. It's, it's, it's a tricky sort of thing, but you can only, like, like I said, at the start of the lecture, you can only control, um, your own project and, and yourself. So, um, you can, you can still apply for all those things. And in the, in, in the pandemic, in terms of, um, finding collaborators, you know, there is, um, there are different forums and social media platforms and, and things like and things like that and i think these are worthy sort of things to you know you follow you can follow like fdcp's page you can follow the different film community pages and 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 socialize in, in that sort of context um, it's not it's not ideal it's not perfect but um it's it's a way to be kept abreast about about information and and um you know know what, what what know what's happening out there and 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 you know you can you you can you know there there have been people that have reached out to me for example over so, social media platforms and um if it's not too strange then then you can <laughs> you continue the conversation so it, it is possible it's just a little bit more difficult yeah i don't i don't deny that but um yeah we have to make do all right. Thank you very much for your wonderful insights, Weijay. Uh, would you like to share some last words for our audience before we end tonight? Um, the film, yeah, the film, the film industry is is difficult. Um, you know, film financing is really difficult. Um, but if you really love your film and you really love your project, you know, I'm I'm, I'm sure you you will find a way to get it made. Um, and what's always really interesting is that oftentimes if you really believe in a project and, and, you, and you really know your project, um, 
it can it things can happen in some very surprising ways. So like for example with taste, I didn't I never expected, for example, Wild Bunch International to come on board. Sometimes when you believe in a project enough and and you're so sure about a project, you know, surprising things can happen. Hopefully good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ray J, for giving us another view on how our, our attendees can secure and take advantage of the resources around them for their film funding. For our attendees, I'm sure you can use this learning to keep on pursuing filmmaking while taking other challenges head on. We would also like to thank our participants for joining us here today. Please let us know your thoughts about our session by answering our iFix survey form that is linked in our chat box. Thank you, keep safe everyone, and we hope to see you in our next sessions. Again, this is the International Film Industry Conference Online 2021. Thank you very much to our speaker for a very insightful talk and to our dear audience for tuning in. Keep safe and we hope to see you in our next sessions. For more details on IFIC, please check our official social media accounts. Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash IFICPHOfficial. Twitter, at IFICPHOfficial. And Instagram, IFICPHOfficial. Check out the full lineup of public sessions and masterclasses for this year's Film Industry Conference. Visit our website at fdcp.ph slash IFIC.